Hello everybody, welcome once again to our testimony time. And uh, today I have a friend of mine, which uh, is lovely just to be able to have Steve here, Steve Saunders. And Steve is going to be sharing with us the things that God's done in his life. And uh, so we welcome you, Steve. It's uh, really nice to be able to come and share today. And uh, okay, I'll over to you. And maybe you just start with who you are, where you were born, whatever. Are you Scott, English or whatever you might be? And uh, okay, there we go. Welcome. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'll do my very best to, to speak clearly and, and not gabble on as I do when I'm normally uh, a wee <laughs> bit tentative. Um, I'm Steve Saunders. I'm currently in my 71st year. I was born in 1949. It's a good year, I'm told. Um, I was born in Watford, uh, just north of London, uh, into a non Christian family. Um, my mum and dad were hardworking, and I got that ethic from them right from the start. Um, we never went to church apart from, I think, Christmas and, and Easter, but it, it, it was never a special occasion. Um, I went to a, oh, one of two, two sons. Um, I've learned through my ancestry that I do have Scots blood in me. Um, my maternal so my paternal grandmother was um, Jessie Murray Graham, and she was born in uh, Camden Lang. And I'm still tracing where they all are. They're all over the world, but that's another story. Um, I was brought up um, south of London uh, by two parents, my mum and my dad, um, lovely couples. My mum died when she was only 47. She had a pulmonary embolism. Oh, wow. uh, and at that stage, uh, I just started college, so it was a bit of a shock. And I only got the, the details maybe three or four years ago when I went for the autopsy, she died at home, um, was ill with pneumonia. It was my first um, three months at college. I went to Newcastle University um, and she died at home without going into hospital. And my dad had no phone. It was a, a real trauma. And none of this came out until about three or four years ago when I started researching <laughs> my life history. Um, my dad, bless him, did two jobs for 22 years. He worked as a, um, a car mechanic and he worked as a printer center operator uh, in a place called um, Queensbury, which is just not as Queensbury, sorry. Um, two jobs from five until one o'clock and then from one o'clock until half past eight in the evening. And he, I never saw my dad. He was a, a Scot, but he wouldn't admit it. Um, he was born Hugh Murray Graham and he became Hugh Murray Graham Saunders when he was adopted. So there's the link with Scotland. Um, I went to a grammar school. I was fortunate enough to pass 11 plus. I slogged it. I, I'm not a bright cookie. I just had to put my head down and charge. And the grammar school, which was all boys, um, stood me in good stead for about six years. I got three A levels and that took me to University um, of Newcastle upon Tyne which I loved. Um, no thoughts of Christianity. Um, I was a geologist. I studied all over Scotland. Um, great bunch of people. They're all long haired. I've got pictures of me with my hair down to me, my shoulders. I was, um, I suppose I was a hippie. I was a bit of a... Yeah, yeah. I was a rocker <laughs> in those days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had a push bike and I, I had a moped and it blew up on me. And that, that's about all I, my claim to say. I've never gotten a motorbike in my life and I wouldn't want to start now. Um, I spent four years at Newcastle doing chemistry, geology as a joint honours and graduated with a 2-2, a um, which then took me on to a master's degree in hydrogeology, which I did at the University of Birmingham. And this is where my dad came in. My mum had died. Um, and I found out that my mum had died. I was sent a telegram. I was in the middle of a chemistry test. And basically, he said, come home, your mum's died. The funeral's on Thursday. So I had to get in my car and drive back down to, down to London. Um, and I can recall her a coughing going through. I can still see it in my head. It's amazing how things stick in your head. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Going through the, the curtain into the thing at the back and the flames enveloping it. I've, it's been it's stuck with me ever since that. But my dad, bless him, um, gave me money to actually finish the MSc course at Birmingham. And I graduated with a master's degree in hydrogeology, which got me into a really good job. Um, I worked for a company called um, Aspinall. 
who were in Shropshire. Um, I was traveling between there and London and, and I met my first wife, Linda, in um, a jazz club. My dad used to be a, a member and a helper at the 100 Club on Oxford Street. You may not know it, Mike, but uh, I spent many a pleasant hour down there. My dad was called Dancing Bill Saunders and he glided around the floor. Um, I would drive home and he would get thoroughly um, the worst for wear as part of his thing. But I mean, that was that was my weekends. If I came back down from university, that's where I'd go. Um, I met Linda there and we got married, although that was a rocky start. She was a bit of a, a loose cannon at the time, spent money quite a lot, diddled me out quite a lot of money, but I ended up getting married to her, which was, a, I think, a surprise for all. And we had our first, my first child, that was Christopher, in February uh, 1978. Um, I'd applied to go overseas. I was working at that stage for a company in London, Sir William Howco Partners, big engineering group, and I'd applied for position in South Africa, which I managed to get. Um, and so I went out for six months uh, work experience in South Africa and Botswana. This is me now, it's my job. I was in the element, I loved it. It's so oh, wild cool. and so woolly out there. Um, eventually Linda and Christopher joined me and we moved on from South Africa to Botswana, to Kenya, to Australia and back again. Um, um, living out suitcases most of the time. We had a house in London, which we kept until we came back. Um, but that was in 1986, and I'm still a non-Christian. But now, at that time, we've got three kids, because my daughter was born in Australia, Perth, Australia, and my youngest son, Ainsley, was born um, in 1980 in south of England. Um, but it put a strain on the marriage. Um, I wasn't be careful what I say. No, I'll be honest with you. I was unfaithful in the first year of our marriage. And even in spite of that, Linda came out and put up with me and my traveling because I was never based anywhere apart from the field because most of the work was actually spent drilling boreholes, testing boreholes. I've got pictures of me in the middle of the Kalahar in the middle of the night, logging boreholes, cutting lines through the desert. I loved it. I was in the element, and uh, as a geologist, you're out there in the wilds. I did the same in, uh, we went on with the, the one child. My daughter, Samantha, was born in Perth in May 1980. We just arrived from Kenya. You have to imagine it. They speak English. You can watch the television and understand what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really quite remarkable. Um, mm -hmm. And we lived in Subiaco and then we moved around Australia, went to the East Coast, West Coast. I was supposed to open up an office in Brisbane, but I'm afraid our marriage had got to the stage where she wanted to go home. She just didn't like, didn't drive. So she was stuck in a country. It gets quite warm in Australia. It's not like living in Scotland. Um, so we came back to England uh, in 1986. Um, I got a job working for... Uh, another engineering company, Howcrow, in Maiden, uh, not Maidenhead, sorry, it was Leatherhead. Um, but the rot had set in and we just said, we tended to drift apart and the marriage got very messy. Uh, there were three kids. I was still working, traveling around. I, I formed a consultancy for Miller Consultants. I was working in uh, near Heathrow and traveling around from Ashford in Surrey where we moved, a lovely house. The rot was there and she started developing Huntington's career. Now, this is a very, very unpleasant disease, but at the time we had no idea what was going on. She used to attack the kids. She used to attack me. She used to lock me out of the house. Um, and this is me. I can't understand what's going on because, you know, I've been unfaithful years before and we, we patched it up and we moved on, but she just got more and more you know, like that plot we saw the other day, you know, there's this big, huge mood swing every so often. Yes. And you had no idea when it was coming. Um, eventually, well, it got very complicated. She made the children wards of court. Um, I ended up getting custody. When we divorced, um, we went through a custody hearing and the, the three kids were actually given to me to be the, the responsible parent. And I'm still a non-Christian, so you know I'm I'm doing my work day. I'm 
taking the computer because in those days you had to <laughs> take the computer with you, drive yeah. around the M25, do a day's work, and then drive back down again. Um, take the young one to the crash and then pick up the two and feed the kids. It got quite tiring, but that was me. I, you know, the worth ethic I, I mentioned earlier for me dad had been instilled in me. So I used to well, work my socks off. There was right. never a, a, a day's rest. The, the joy was in the kids. Uh -huh. But when Linda was in the house, everything just turned upside down. Yeah. You know, yeah. she was ruly, she was argumentative, untidy. Um, and it's quite difficult when you're in a, in a house with three kids and you're trying to maintain the sort of even kill. Um, because you just have to bite your tongue. And I suppose that was <laughs> something I learned to do. But I was the one who used to get most of the aggravation. But she was particularly hard on my oldest son, Christopher. Um, we got divorced in 1991. Um, still as a non-Christian. And I, I can picture me now. We had a house in Ashton, which was next to a pub. And my life was just literally work, home, cooking, get out the computer and work again. I mean, it was just yeah. nonstop because I was actually heading up an environmental section. I worked for companies and I was now working for myself. Um, and of course, there's big responsibility for that. Um, in 1995, I'm looking at the dates now, um, I went on holiday to a place which I love, uh, Ferti Ventura. And uh, I met um, Davina Graham Jackson on holiday. Um, right. I'd gone because my dad and my mum, my stepmother at that stage, were run, running a trad jazz festival. And I quite liked them. Okay. I met Davina on a bus. I was picking the money out of the, the people's hands and putting it in my dad's hands. And I was sitting doing a telegraph crossword. This is all pre Christ, of course. Um, and I turned around and I asked her a question, one of the clues. They're all cliptic clues. Now, yeah. after 22 years married to 23 years, she's quite good at them. But at the time, no idea. But there was a, for me anyway, it was a mutual attraction. And, and you know, we, we got talking over the holiday and I, I found out that she was a Christian, which, you know, when, when I'd taken stock of my previous 14 years marriage, I had a list of things that were required of my new partner. Uh, and being a Christian was not on the list. Right. Uh, you know, you can laugh at that, and I can laugh at it, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this, what does that mean? You know, because, I mean, I was brought up, you know, to say please and thank you, and we went to church on good days and, and sometimes bad days, mainly Easter and, and Christmas, but the thought of actually marrying a Christian no, never, never entered my head. Anyway, Davina at that stage was living in St. Moments and I was living in Ashton. So it's about 500 miles between us. It's, it's quite a big gap. Um, but when I came back from the holiday, um, I said, can I see you before Christmas? And she said, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going out to Romania because at that stage, Davina was support, supporting a, someone called Nan Beveridge, who you, you probably won't know. But yes, I've heard of her. Ah, yes, Nan Beveridge. Yes, yes. A wonderful woman of, of, mm -hmm. of God. And mm -hmm. Davina went out to hold her handbags. That's what right. got up, going out to support. So I came up to St. Moments on the bus. Couldn't even find the house. Never mind find St. Moments. I couldn't find the house. And she gave me a, a Christmas present, which um, you can see how battered and... <laughs> is that an old Thompson's, is it? It's a Thompson's Bible, is it? Uh, it's, uh, an, yeah. it's a New King James Spirit-Filled Life Bible, which... Right. Um, there's a scripture underlined in it. Be ye not unequally yoked. Right. Okay. I know. It's a big question mark over my head. So what does that mean? So I thought, well, I'd better start looking. Um, and she said to me, um, I said, can we go out for a meal? I said, well, I, she said to me later, I'll have to pray about that. This is all rather strange. You know, I'm, <laughs> we're only going out for a meal. I'm not the man axman of Ashton. I'm just asking her out for a social evening and anyway she gave me the scripture and it was be you not unequally yoked and of course I understand what it is now but it prompted me to come back to Ashton and the local church was a church of England it was sort of head, fairly high level stuff but I they were actually running an alpha course and I managed to get to eight of them because traveling meant 
you don't always you're not always there during the week so um i attended it i missed i think one of the, the spirit week fair weekend i managed right. to avoid yeah um you've got kids in you can't always be it but i really enjoyed coming together with the people and they're all what do you call it? they're all searching they're all looking for something in their lives and um i didn't commit myself on the course but i used to walk i still walk quite a lot um, and i can recall um march 86 and i'm not sure what drove me to it but it was baltic and i used to go out before taking the kids to school and just i'd been meditating on god's word and i was like a sponge i was taking lots of stuff in um, but not really understanding it. And I have to say that applies even today, 22 years on, there's still a lot of stuff that I really don't understand. Um, Fair enough. But uh, on this walk, just everything came together. The, the colours of the... Uh, there was a pink hue through the trees. The trees had no leaves on them at this time of year, but just everything sharpened. Everything seemed to come into focus. And I committed myself to myself, to, to God in that state. So I, I committed, you know, there, were, like, there was no singing, there was no voices in heaven, but I just felt a peace upon me. And just the, the colours that came out of the, the trees and the bushes and the flowers that were in bloom, but just seemed so much sharper and so much brighter. And I said to Davina later, you know, I've, I've done this, because at this time we were actually communicating with faxes you know we, we, no such thing as phones that you could speak and all the rest of it so it's, it's going back a few years but that started the journey um it's interesting because at that time i was still working mainly down south but and this has been part of my testimony in the past just about every job i had in the south of england went and i started getting work up in scotland wow I worked for the, the dockyards in Doomray. I worked for Rosyth. I did some engineering work for Baptist in Glasgow. I was spending more time <clears throat> up and down in aircraft than I was actually at home with the kids. Fortunately, I had a good um, support group, uh, child miners and the rest of it. And I suppose the kids were getting a little bit older. Um, and eventually, <clears throat> I took Davina to um, Loch Lomond at Luss, um, yeah, L U W S, and I went down on my knees and proposed to her in the hotel in Luss. Right. And to my surprise and delight, she said yes. Oh um, my, okay. Um, and in and on June the fifteenth, nineteen ninety-seven, right, we were married in the Apostolic Church in Kokodi. Yes. Uh, and that was a shock to me. Not the fact that we got married, but I used to, I used to attend this thing. When, when we become married, I used to attend the church, and they would be speaking in this funny language, um, singing in this funny language, which to me, I hadn't got a clue. I mean, I really hadn't got, no idea what it was, but it was it opened up my eyes to what's possible in the spiritual realm because people were talking in tongues and other people were in, interpreting in tongues. Um, that never happened in the Church of England. And in fact, it doesn't happen in many churches. And I'm not criticising what goes on in the church. I'm just saying that not a lot of the churches are open to the spiritual dimension um, that the Apostolic Church was in Kakodi. Um, so that was a learning curve. But... Um, one of the guys who attended the, the, the ceremony was a guy called Andy Murison. And he and I had been working together as consultants down in Henfield in, in the south of England. And I'm, I'm amazed at this point because when we started work together, Andy had been running all over the place, even more so than me. And he had three children. He never saw his wife. And he said, look, I'm, I'm looking for stability and a group called Willis Cahoon Hinton, who were insurance brokers, got us to work on a landfill site which needed to be re remediated. So it's a great job. Um, and I said to Andy, OK, well, we're not worried about a starter's fee, but at the end of the year, you can pay me a sum of money um, and we'll sort it out then. Well, 
the end of the year came and went and Andy hadn't got the money. And as a young Christian, I hadn't got the grace to let it go. I got quite angry with him. Um, it was quite a sum of money. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until about 10 years later did I, uh, but, uh, there's a whole pile of stuff about family, which I'm avoiding at this stage, just to keep on this particular focus. I met his wife in the area that my youngest son was living. And I wished her well and said, give my best wishes to Andy. And, and you know, I suppose at that stage I was wise enough to say, right, enough, Lord, I need to let go of it. Because God, in his grace and mercy, had supplied a whole pile of things. All this transfer from England, to, you know, I was, I was learning. I was you know, soak, not only soaking it in, but learning it. And, you know, within a week and a half of forgiving Andy, I had a call from Hunterson Power Station here in Ayrshire. Would you like to come and work for us? No, I hadn't got a clue where it was. No, no idea. Um, so I travelled up and had the interview. Um, and I got a contract at Hunderstill, which went from 2003 to 2013. Do you know, overnight, and this is the principle of letting go and forgiving people, God blesses you for doing that. And it's such a, a powerful lesson. And this was powerful for me because I was still fritting on about the money that I hadn't got paid. Yeah. My salary went from 30000 a year to a hundred. Wow. I, okay. I could cycle to work. Right? We lived in a house overlooking the Clyde. I mean, it was just like you couldn't get any better. Mm -hmm. um, but it taught me the value of, you know, the Bible says the biggest block between us and God is unforgiveness. And I thoroughly believe that. You, you need, and it's a hard lesson sometimes, you need to let go and commit whatever you've got to God and let him deal with it. And it was the same up here with my youngest son. Um, he's now 30 something, but at the time he was just a raw youngster, 16, 17, pulled out the South of England. He came up to live in Simonians when we got married. So my wife looked after two of my kids and my eldest kid, Christopher, stayed down South because he was busy working where he was. And Ainsley used to, oh, Davina said to me when we met, your kids won't be a problem. As a Christian, they're not a problem, right? Well, I don't know if you'd say that today, but I mean, Samantha in particular, the, my the daughter, who for the five years that I was on my own in Ashgid was mum, dad, bottle washer, bed changer, boy feeder, shopper, the whole lot, yeah. because I was out there working most of the time, so I'm blissfully unaware of what's going on. Um, but my youngest son became very truculent. He came up and lived here. He stole Davina's car. He wrecked it. He was trashing things in the harbour. We lived in a lovely spot in, in St. Moans, if you know the area. Um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's a house overlooking the harbour. For us as, as adults, perfect. But for him as a young man of 16, that's good. Um, we had an instance where he was picked up by the police and I said to the police, can't you not keep him in the prison overnight just for one night, just to teach him a lesson? No, sir, you'll have to come and get him. Well, he was put into a care home in Kokodi. He absconded from that and he broke into the house that we still had in Ashton. I mean, it was just never ending. Right. And I, I, again, there's a learning curve there. You, you could only do so much for your kids. And they get to an age where they need to make their own mistakes and you have to make your own. Uh -huh. so basically, it's <clears throat> over to you, God, because I can't cope with it. I still love my son, but I don't have what it takes mm -hmm. not, not to manage it. I can love him and, until the, and I still exactly. love him. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so that was one incident. Um, family life. So the incident the health and happiness of the family was paramount to me, but um, my first wife was found on the streets of London. To actually settle the home, we had to give her a, a sum out of the, mm -hmm. the overall mortgage. Uh, and she blew the whole lot very quickly um, and was ended up on the streets in London very ill. And it was diagnosed that she had Huntington's career 
Right, okay. And that, or Huntington's, I forget, there's another name for it. Yeah. Now, it's a nasty disease, and it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It's a 50-50 chance. You toss a coin, it's 50-50 chance. At this time, I was going to um, the Businessman's Fellowship in Greener. I started up here in Scotland, in Mark Inch, um, moved across the West Coast when we got the job at Hunderson. Um, and one of the things that doing and I did, we, we were sort of admin people. I think there's the administration of helps and admin. It's not a very sexy area of... Very of important the, one, though, but yeah, very good. Important one, yeah. So, for instance, Davina did four years in National Prayer Breakfast. Yes, yes. I helped her with the computers. I was the secretary and then the president of the BMF in Greenock for over five years. Mm -hmm. And in one of the meetings we used to have, and these are real blessings these meetings, every month we used to have a, a speaker. And the, the speaker this particular day was a guy called George who played a guitar and he gave his testimony. And he came up with a friend called Lawrence Kidd. Now, Lawrence was a bit older than George, but he was a prophet. And I sat and told him about my, my kids, and the fact that my wife had had Huntington's disease. My youngest son had had one child and hadn't been tested, right? And my daughter was now aware of it and was going to counselling in Dunfermline. And I sat there, no, no word of a lie, I, I sat there wibbling when he said to me, the Holy Spirit has told me to tell you your kids are healed. Right. right. Oh, <laughs> I can still feel the, the tears welling sure. up in your eyes. Yeah. They're healed. Not they haven't got it. They are healed. Now, Ainsley, about a year later, had a second child. Right? But this time, he had to go and have a test. No counselling, nothing. You just go in, they take a blood sample, yeah. and you've either got it or you haven't got it. Now, praise God, negative, right? My daughter had gone through the ropes. I mean, I took her to places in Dunfermline where people that have got this, this rather nasty disease, they can't even pick up a, a glass bottle or a cup of tea because it just goes everywhere. Right. So she was tested, and at Christmas, a couple of years later, negative. So that's two out of, I mean, the odds are getting more and more remote. Right. And my eldest son, who is now 40-something, 40 44 next year, wouldn't take the test. But you get to a stage in your development where you become unable to get the thing because you get it later in life than you do, sorry, earlier in life than you do with your mother or your father, whoever's got it. And he's just had our sixth grandchild and he can't have it either. No, right. So praise God. Yeah. I mean, and that guy, Lawrence, was spot on. I've told him since he was spot on. And God's word is truth. I mean, and I just sat there listening. But it's... By the way, sorry, did, did your ex-wife recover? My ex-wife died 15 years ago. And to the credit to my daughter, she stayed down in... She was put in a home in Hazelmere. Mm -hmm. um, Davina and I went to see her. I mean, the guy, when I met the specialist in London, uh, he said... The gene is deeply embedded. This is the, the, the DNA, and you, yeah, yeah. you can't extract it. Now, I don't know whether that's changed. He said it's a sexy area of science, whatever that's supposed to mean. Um, but at the time it was diagnosed in 1991, there was no hope. Oh, and she yeah. died 10, 12 years later. She withered away. I mean, it's just... Debilitate. Come to faith, though. No, not as far as you know. Oh, we prayed over, and she did not come to faith. But there's another story. Um, my father, bless him. Um, we got out to see my dad a couple of times, and my dad was not terribly <laughs> patient with my three kids, so we didn't go out there too often. Um, but we used to send him a Cockney rhyme in Bible. You can get a a Bible that's Cockney slang because my yes. dad was born in yeah. London. Yeah. Uh, it always came back. It's like the bad penny. It always used to run back, but he would never accept it. But my brother and I went out to Fertig Ventura to bury him just because the stepmom was out there and invited us out there. So I took the service and read out of Ecclesiastes, there's a time to die, I died of the voice. Yes. And dancing Bill Saunders, and it's funny what they do in Fertig Ventura. But before he was 
put into his coffin. He was draped there in his big white robes with a cross on the front of it. Because they're all Catholics, of course. So they oh, all right, OK. Believe it all. <laughs> now, I don't know. I can only hope that my son, my, my dad, accepted Christ before he went to meet his maker, because we've all got that, haven't we, eventually? Yes, exactly. Um, but they don't put them below ground. I mean, you've seen the volcano that's going on just now in... Yes. Um, because mm -hmm. so the bedrock is all hard, they put them up in a concrete above ground. So they're all buried above ground. There, oh, there is sorry. no soft ground on Puerto Ventura that you can access. Volcanic, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, my dad was a bit of, oh, I love my dad, but um, he just would not talk about himself. I suppose that's been half the problem with me trying to get back to my roots and find out where I am. I am you know, where was I born? Where, where, in terms of Christ, it, it doesn't matter. But in terms of just knowing, it would be nice to know some of the Scottish roots. I've, I've got some. So that's me up until about uh, 2009 when the Depression came. You were probably aware of that. And in 2009, the work at Hunderston dried up. Yeah, 2008, 2009, yeah. But praise God, three days, that's a good number, and three days before I was due to be laid off, because I'm there as a consultant. I'm not actually working for the workforce. They came to me and said, look, we've got a, a position for you as a, a technical author. Do you want to try it? You know, you'd not be earning as much as you were, but I was still earning <laughs> yeah, right. uh, a great deal of money, and I was still cycling along and really remarkable. Um, so I took it and only retired, I think seven years later, I actually retired from work when I left Hunderson. So God was good, God was gracious. And all that time, um, at the beginning of the time, we were going to the Apostolic Church in um, Paisley. But God spoke to both of us. Um, it's amazing how God brings people into your life when you need support, when you need a word. Um, the, the church in Fairley was a, a church of Scotland. And I'm not here to criticise the church of Scotland because there's some lovely people in it. But if I tell you, we were on a spiritual weekend, but the wife and I went on and we come back to the Kirk session meeting and say to one of the guys, oh, we've just been to a great meeting. It's all been spirit filled. And it, he said, we're not into that here. We're Presbyterians. I think, well, come on. This, you know, there are three members of the Trinity and you need to accept that they are who they are and you know they're equally as important in fact i was listening to john g cho a couple of weeks ago and he was sharing about the growth of his church in south korea and he's, he's he got to three thousand five hundred, and he couldn't go any further he was just wondering why he couldn't get any more people in his church and the holy spirit said to him that's because you're leading and you're not allowing me to lead now, someone said to me when I came to faith that I had a resistant spirit in me. And I, I recognise that, and I still recognise it. I mean, I was self-made. I was busy this, busy doing that, always trying to plan my own route. And how many times do we say, you know, the way of man is wrong, but the way of God is perfect? It's a learning curve. As I shared on Sunday, we're all works in progress. God is long-suffering with us god is patient with us and he's got yes. a, a plan and purpose for our life if only we would let him get on with it mm -hmm. i have to say you know you know what i'm like i'm always doing something it's, it's, you're the same but you have to say to god okay i can't cope with this i'd rather have you do it your way and, and i'll just come along meekly and humbly and do the way it should be done rather than me wasting all this time or rework and all the rest of it so um yeah i had and i still have a resistant spirit i'm not totally open and we sing that song don't we i surrender all i surrender all but in faith and in truth before you and god now i still retain bits of me and but i'm grateful it says in what psalm 138 that he has begun a work and he is going to complete it. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus said when he was speaking to the disciples just after having met them at the well. Uh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me 
and to finish it. The work. Mm -hmm. And by God's grace, that's what it's at. So Ministry of Helps, yeah, we've done that, National Prayer Breakfast, BMF. Um, I'm now helping out the, the church here. We're now part of two churches. It's a bit of a strange situation. But when we came across from the West Coast, we went to a, a meeting on Butte, a prophetic meeting. And we stood up hand in hand and the woman said, hmm, I can see you're on a bus just now and you're not welcome on the bus. Right? This was just, she didn't know us from a bar, so she said, get off the bus and wait for empty ones to come along. Yeah, what does that mean? Anyway, so I kept going back and forth for 18 months to finish the work schedule and then came over here and we still hadn't committed to a church until D Davina was led to go to the AOG church. Um, and that started us facilitating a monthly meeting here for three years called Rekindle. I think I've mentioned that to you before. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. so we would set up the meeting and the guys from Sterling would come over here and lead the meeting, do praise and worship and give a word. And we were just being faithful and open it up. And no word of a lie, Mike. We had people come in. The, the, the prayer was that God would come and be in the meeting. We didn't want those are people that were interested. We wanted people that were going to come in and listen to God. Every time he was faithful, he turned up. The meeting was blessed. People were being healed in the meeting. We were praying for people outside the meeting. They were being healed because we were just simply giving the meeting over to him. And again, it's a learning curve <laughs> in my experience. You know, if you get out of the way, you give God a chance to move. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, see, so you remind me of that, you know, that we used to wear a badge, wouldn't it? Please, be, you know, please be patient with me. God has not finished with me yet, you know, and that <laughs> ongoing thing. But I'm recognising that we're coming now, you know, for the timing. Um, just for the end, and you'll usually finish this sort of conversation, which is, a, you know, it's a... Is there a, a particular scripture you would just like to pass on to those who are listening to you today? And uh, then as we come to a conclusion, maybe you could just finish with a prayer. But uh, yeah, I, I did finish. We sang this. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be allowed to lead the Salvation Army, which is our other string to the bow here last week. Uh -huh. And we started off with, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you Hallelujah, hallelujah. Um, that's one. Uh, and the other one, I'll, can I read it? Please do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely. I just love this scripture. Um, I was reading um, last night, and this brought tears to my eyes too, how Christ spoke to Peter after the resurrection, the third time. Um, and he said to Christ, do you love me? Mm -hmm. He said to Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I do, Lord, right? Now, Peter is using the filio form of love, right? Mm -hmm. And he does it three times, and every time he uses a filio. Um, and then Christ says, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, follow me. Now, of course, and he talks about how Peter's going to get inverted when he dies. But the, the bottom line is when Peter started after the Holy Spirit had fallen, he uses the word agape. Mm -hmm. nine times in the paragraph rather than filio. So I hadn't picked that one up before, but um, let me just read you this. I love this. Um, oh, right. Mm -hmm. right. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for saints according to the will of God. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I'll miss the next one. What then can we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall persecution or distress or nakedness or famine or peril or sword as it is written for your sake we are killed all day long we are counted as sheep for the slaughter yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and here's the 
For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm -hmm. I just love Romans. So I can read it every day, all day. And that, that's a great verse just to, yeah, conclude on that God works all things together for the good. And again, of those who love him. And I mean, just to maybe address the folks who are maybe looking in today. I mean, obviously there you've heard Steve's testimony and how in an amazing way he's come to know Christ. And of course, the challenge that both me and Steve would want today is that if you're looking in, that you yourself, would be willing if you never done so just like steve did just to be willing to receive christ just to trust him and just to ask him just to forgive and to guide your life and maybe steve if and there may be somebody who would maybe want to respond to that from looking at this maybe would you like just to do a prayer to to finish with and conclude on that yeah thanks mark um... I was a self-made man, um, in the words of Frank Sinatra, before I became a yes. Christian, I did things my way. Uh, there is a better way, but it means letting go of yourself and surrendering to one who died for you at Calvary. Um, and every time, uh, and even as Christians, we are still taken astray, as it said in Romans there, but every time most of the times i'm way with my thoughts or what i say i go back to what christ has done for me personally at calvary he's given up his life and the bible says that no greater gift than that the man would give up his life for his friend he not only calls us friends but he calls us brothers and uh, if you are listening to this prayer uh, my my desire and Christ's desire is that you come to know him in a very real and, and meaningful way. Uh, if you're a, a male listening to this, rest assured that you and your family will soon see the difference in you. Uh, for me personally, um, it was hard for my kids to take. I was a cuddly man, lots of this, that and the other, but uh, I've changed and I've changed for the better. And we know that as Mike has I said, all things work together. So if you are listening to this and you just want to commit yourself to Christ, you just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and you will be saved. And the angels in heaven, as it was when my wife gave her testimony and gave her life to Christ, are rejoicing over one more person who has joined the kingdom of God rather than the kingdom of this world. And uh, we just pray that uh, if you do commit to Christ after listening to this be do to get in touch with Mike and share with it because we will be rejoicing also we ask this in Jesus name mm -hmm. amen well thanks so much Stephen thanks for looking into this testimony it's been really I mean I find you know chatting to folks like yourself Steve it's just such it's so encouraging and just to see the way that God leads us as individuals all of our life the way and as we trust him he you know, he certainly, I will guide you with my eye. And that is the truth, what the Lord's done for you. Amen. Well, thanks again. And thank you, everybody, for looking in. And hopefully we'll have a, and I can just get find my right uh, plug here to uh, just finish. And, uh, but thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching.